Now, he was completely free from this unnatural pride that might have arisen from all the good qualities he had. He had good education, riches, beauty, aristocracy, and so on. This is a very, very divine quality. When you have everything and you're not proud. Even a beggar who has nothing is proud. The mind will think of something to be proud of. If you're laying on the side of the sewage ditch with others and a rat comes up, you see, oh, you see the rats like me better than you. Your mind will think of something to be proud of. It has to. But here, when we find somebody who's wealthy, what happens when you're wealthy? So much power you get from your wealth. And so many people look up to you and ask favors and depend on you because of your wealth. Good education. Very learned, very adept mind to find solutions very quickly to be able to cite different books, different histories, different equations, whatever it may be. Aristocracy, beauty. Prahlad was very beautiful. He was so charming. He just attracted everybody by his little beauty and everything. But he had no unnatural pride. Why? If you put yourself in the center, then you have to be proud of all those things. But if you put Krishna in the center, then you understand. Uh, Krishna tells in Gita, whatever opulences are anywhere in this world, in anyone, it is only a spark of my splendor. Punarmushtaka bhava. Krishna can make you a lion, Krishna can make you a mouse. Nothing to be proud of. God is great. And Srimad Bhagavatam tells how great is God. And although Prahlad was born in a family of Asuras, he was not an Asura. He was a great devotee. And here is a very key sentence that may cause us to tremble. Unlike the other Asuras, this is very, very strong language. I don't want to offend you, but these are the words of Prabhupada. These are the words of Sutta Goswami. These are the words of Sukadev Goswami. These are the words of Narada Muni. So I feel bold enough to speak it. Unlike the other Asuras, he was never envious of a Vaishnava. What does that mean? <laughs> Very powerful statement. Do you understand what that means? <laughs> what are you if you are envious of a Vaishnava? <laughs> say, it, say it loud. <laughs> the A at the beginning should be. <laughs> I'm hearing Sura. <laughs> so please emphasize the first syllable. According to Srimad Bhagavatam, if you're envious of Vaishnavas, you are Hare Krishna. Somebody doesn't like this. Hare 
Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Assembled here as a Vaishnav How many of you have some envy toward another Vaishnav in your heart? You may be a Vaishnav. Now everybody raise their hands. Does that mean everyone's an Asura? So that means if I'm envious of them, I'm not an Asura because they're not Vaishnavas because they raise their hand. <laughs> This is the way the mind justifies things. <laughs> it is an asura quality. That envy is an asura quality. And if these anartas, especially the anarta of envy, or lust, anger, pride, greed, illusion. They are also like sparks. If we are not very, very careful to monitor them, to control them, to subdue them, and that takes effort. Then what we'll do is we'll start feeding them and it will grow, grow, grow. Jayato Vishayan Pung Sang Sangas Te Shuba Jayate Sangat Sanjayate Kama Kama Kuro Bajayate. At the beginning we contemplate the objects of the senses. We may contemplate envy. We may contemplate greed or pride. Any of these things. From such contemplation, attachment develops. From attachment, if we don't curb it, if we don't curb it, if we don't monitor that spark, because now it's growing into a flame, it becomes lust. Lust means a craving. Now we could identify this just as the physical lust. On a subtle level, all these things are lust. Greed is a type of lust, is it not? Greed is lust for money. Envy is lust to hurt somebody. Pride is a lust for prestige and distinction. First there's contemplation. Anger is a lust for vengeance. Yes? Lust. And then the flame's getting bigger. The warning signals are becoming stronger. We have to do something about this. But if we keep feeding it, lust becomes frustrated into anger. Anger is stirring in our heart. Are we going to do something about it? Are we going to subdue it? Are we going to divert that energy in a positive spiritual way? If not, anger bewilders the memory. That means all the hundreds and hundreds of Srimad Bhagavatam classes where we learn all nice things and all the um, times we've read the scriptures and all the prayers we've offered, Bewildering to memory means at that moment we forget it all. It's just not there. When memory is bewildered, it challenges is lost. We do things we know we're not supposed to do, but in that moment our intelligence.
intelligence just cannot discriminate. And then we fall down again into the material pool. It's due to neglect. Tani saravani samyamya yukta asita matpara. The sehi asyindriyani tasiparakya pratishtata. The solution, we must restrain our senses. But simultaneously we must fix our consciousness on Krishna. We can't just restrain our senses. We just can't say no, 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 no. We must say no. But we must divert our attention toward Krishna. Keep ourselves busy in Krishna consciousness. Idle mind is devil's workshop. When Maya attacks in this way, at the very beginning, at the time of contemplation, and as it grows, we should just start reading from Prabhupada's books, or start doing some active service to occupy our mind or senses, or most of all, connect ourselves back to Krishna, fill our minds with his holy names, or do something. Rather, we should check it. We should understand this envy in my heart is an asura. It is a demon. Am I going to allow this asura to conquer me, to take me away from Krishna? Or am I going to fight this asura of envy? And how do we do that? by really trying to appreciate that by Krishna, who to empower and who not to. We should feel Krishna is pleased. Krishna is conquered by one who feels joy in the success of others. Krishna is repelled, disgusted, by one who is envious of the success of others. So whatever's in our heart, let us act to what, according to what we should be doing. Let us speak what we should speak. That will show our sincerity to not be an asura. Sorry about that, but... <laughs> He was not agitated when he was in danger. Because he had faith in Krishna. He considered everything material to be useless. Now this is very interesting. Because he was five years old. But later on he was made the king. And kings have to deal with a lot of materialistic things. He was ruling his whole race. Yes. He had crown. In fact, Lord Brahma put crown on him. Yes. And set him on throne and palaces and everything else. How can you be running a kingdom when you think everything material is useless? Because he was seeing useless from the perspective of what's of real value. There's only one thing of real value forever and that is bhakti, devotional service. That is the only thing of value. Meha bhikramanasasti pratyavayonya vidyate Because any devotional service you render is forever. It's never lost. Anything else you earn will be lost. And the more you earn, the more you'll suffer when it's lost. Yes? While I was in the airplane yesterday, I saw news. Very interesting. Throughout the ages, India has been famous, or we can say infamous, for poverty. It's considered just dirty, poverty-stricken place. Of the billionaires in the world, in the top ten, 
There are more billionaires in the top 10 of the world in India than anywhere else in the world. America had two billionaires in the top 10. India had four. And America was second place. That means India had twice as many billionaires than any other country in the world, as far as the 10 richest men in the world. Hare Krishna. And most of them live in Bombay. <laughs> and there was another survey of the 25 dirtiest cities in the world. <laughs> Bombay was number seven. Now, how many of you think that Bombay is cleaner than Delhi? Delhi was number 24. Now, this is a serious question I'm going to ask you. How many think Calcutta is dirtier than Bombay? Huh? Raise your hands. Well, your pride is finished. <laughs> Calcutta was thoroughly examined. It's not even on the list. Not even on the list. Bombay's number seven. That means we're far filthier than Calcutta. <coughs> what that has to do with class, I'll try to figure out a connection. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an interesting statistic. <laughs> so all these billionaires, Prahlad Maharaj is saying everything material is useless. Because they'll lose it, either in this life or in death. And all those millions in and of itself could do nothing for the soul of anyone. But if you understand what is really useful is our relationship with God, in our devotion to God. That is the only useful thing. It's the only thing with permanence. It's the only thing that's real. Then, yukta vairagya. Then we could use all of those things in a useful way because we're using them in devotion, in devotional service. Millions of dollars, billions of dollars, quadrillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, all, everything could be used in Krishna's service and when it's used for the proper purpose with the right consciousness, then the thing itself is very useful. Material and spiritual. Everything in this world, Rupa Goswami describes, is, is spiritual by nature. Om Purnamada Purnamidam. Everything is coming from Krishna. Krishna is spiritual. How can, how can darkness come out of the sun? Only when you turn away from the sun is there darkness. So everything is Krishna's energy. And if, you use Krishna, if you're looking toward Krishna and using Krishna's energy for Krishna's pleasure, then everything is spiritual. When we use things looking into the darkness of the shadow, then everything is material. So for Prahlad Maharaj, everything material was useless. That means anything separated from Krishna is useless. And therefore, he could use the whole kingdom and all the resources of the kingdom in useful ways because it was in the service of God. And what is the greatest service of God we can perform in this world? to bring the spirit souls closer to God. That is God's mission in this world. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, it is described that the whole 
purpose of material existence is f- to facilitate the conditioned souls to go back home, back to Godhead. That's the reason of creation, to facilitate conditioned souls to go back to Godhead. In all the sufferings, and all the heavens, and all the hells, and all the dualities, and all the three modes, and everything else, is all just those facilities. Somehow or other, it's what conditioned souls need to go through to make that wise choice of going back home, back to Godhead. <clears throat> he was always controlled his senses and life air, and being of steady intelligence and determination, he, su- he subdued all lusty desires. This is the way to subdue lusty desires. We must, first of all, have steady intelligence. That comes by hearing, by hearing regularly. Sravanam Kirtanam Vishnu. The first process of bhakti is sravanam, hearing. Hearing harikata, not hearing newspapers and all these other things. We may get some information that we could use in Krishna's service for those purposes. But we shouldn't enjoy them. Yes? We should enjoy, we should take inspiration in hearing about Krishna, hearing the philosophy of bhakti. And by nasta praeshya bhadreshu nityam bhagavati sevaya, by hearing regularly, our intelligence is steady. But then with that steady intelligence, determination is required to practice it no matter what. Even in the face or even when being confronted by temptation, danger, threat, we should be determined determined to be steady in our intelligence, to make the right choices. Recently in Mayapur, our godbrother Anuttama Prabhu defined the meaning of responsibility. Srila Prabhupada said, we make advancement in Krishna consciousness according to how we accept responsibility. So this is a very important word. We make advancement in Krishna consciousness according to how we accept responsibility. But how can you accept something if you do not know what it means? How many of us really know what responsibility means? He gave a very nice explanation. Responsibility is two words. Ability, yes, and response. Does that answer your question? So whatever comes in our life, whether it's temptations, from within or without, whether it's confrontations from within and without, how we respond is what will either elevate us or degrade us. Response ability means our ability to respond in every possible situation in Krishna consciousness is how we make progress. The choice that we make in every provocative condition that may come in our life. Oftentimes in lectures of marriage, we say that don't worry about love because you don't know what love is. 
especially when it's between a man and woman. That's the most bewildering misconception of love, usually. Yes? Because it's based on physical features, it's based on personality traits, it's based on maybe theoretical astrological compatibilities. <laughs> it's not about love. It may be about attraction, but that attraction is very much emotional and physical. And what happens with emotional, physical attractions? How long do they last? They may last a few hours, they may last a few days, or maybe a few years. But then, Familiarity breeds contempt. And soon, you know, the attraction is gone. The thrill of our relationship, that thrill, it's gone. Forever. but I start feeling some thrills coming from somebody else now. <laughs> Marriage is about responsibility. Love, affection, attraction, it may be there, it may, be, it may not be there, don't worry about it. What's gonna keep people together and keep people happy together is responsibility. That means our ability to respond to each other, to situations, to everything in a way that is pleasing to Krishna. Living in brahmachari life. The amazing thing is I see as much love between the brahmacharis as I see husbands and wives, sometimes even more. Not physical, sexual, amorous, or any of those things, but a sense of real responsibility. We have responsibility to each other. So steady intelligence, determination. Determination, in this sense, really means determined to be responsible to be able to respond properly in every situation. Now, Srila Prabhupada in his purport, <clears throat> I guess this is the beginning of class. He is saying that a person is not qualified or disqualified simply by birth. It's a matter of how one takes these responsibilities. To live by divine characteristics. Prahlad Maharaj was born in a family of Asuras. But yet, he possessed the qualities of a perfect Brahman. And anyone can become a fully qualified Brahman under the direction of a spiritual master, Prahlad Maharaj provided a vivid example of how to think of the spiritual master and accept his directions calmly. <clears throat> this is the key that opens the door to the spiritual world. All of these virtues and divine qualities of Prahlad Maharaj are all built on the foundation of his accepting the directions of his spiritual master. Yes, if we study DNA and genes and all these things, you know, Coming from the semen of Hiranyakashipu is a very dangerous situation. <clears throat> and all the demigods, the demigods are greater scientists than anyone on this earth. 
they know all this DNA stuff and and how the genes work and how you you adopt different qualities from the from your father and from your mother and everything like that. They very expert. Like father, like son. Chip off the old block. So they're dealing with Hiranyakashipu. And here comes another one. So they kid well Hiranyakash they couldn't do anything when Hiranyakashipu was present because he was too powerful. So when he was away, like espionage. When he was away, they came and stole his wife. <clears throat> Kept her in the prison of their, of the, of their control with the sole aim to murder the child when it was born. Yes. Narada Muni came and said, actually, this child will be a great Mahabhagavat. They trusted him. <coughs> Narada Muni preached to the mother and the embryo. Prahlad, in the womb, surrendered his life to the teachings of Narada Muni. And he gave all credit to that only. He was preaching to his father. Hiranyakashipu asked this little five-year-old Prahlad, what, what is the best knowledge you have learned in school? Prahlad Maharaj says, one who considers this body to be the self, and who considers the things related to the body to be mine is an illusion, is an ignorance. My father, you should just give up all your ignorance and you're in a dark, deep well. He's the king of the universe, sitting on a throne, and Prahlad saying, you're in a dark, deep well. Who, who are you to tell me? <laughs> Therefore, you should give it all up and go to Vrindavan and surrender to Krishna. Where did he learn this? When he was preaching to his little friends, they said, where did you learn this, Prahlad? You're in the same school as us. Certainly not at home. He said, everything I learned is from my Guru Maharaj. And when Narasingha Dev finally came and appeared only for the pleasure of Prahlad, liberated his father, Narasingha Dev asked Prahlad, ask any benediction. Prahlad Maharaj with folded palms. He said, I am nothing but an Asura, born in an Asura family. I'm the lowest. But due to the mercy of my Guru Maharaj, Narada Muni, that is my only qualification. So Prahlad Maharaj, under all circumstances, responsible. He responded to blasphemy. He responded to the temptations of being the king of the universe. He responded to dangers of being thrown in the ocean and thrown in fire and thrown under the feet of stampeding elephants, thrown into pits of venomous snakes. Any one of us, we just see a little snake. We don't even know if it's envious. And, ah, we run away. He was thrown into a pit of venomous snakes. How did he respond? By taking shelter of the directions of his spiritual master. That's all. He had that determination. Prahlad Maharaj provided a vivid example of how to think of the spiritual master and accept his directions calmly. Srila 
Prabhupada had such great faith in this principle. Otherwise, how could he go to the Western world? There were no Brahmins in the Western world. How could he give Brahminical initiation, even though he was condemned and even had th death threats from people in India? Because he had complete faith that if one simply accepts the directions of the spiritual master, one is truly a Brahmin. One is a Vaishnav, greater than a Brahmin. That was the main thing that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was not allowed in the temples of Vrindavan. They locked the doors with his disciples. He had death threats. In Navadweep, he was stoned by people who wanted to kill him, ridiculed, blasphemed. Why? For one reason. Because he was giving Brahminical initiation to people who were of lower caste. Why did he risk so much to do that? Why did Prabhupada and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada endure so much persecution for that? Because it is the truth. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Adwaita Charya, they gave the most exalted position to Haridas Thakur, who was an outcast. Narottam Das Thakur was also death threats and all sorts of blasphemy because he was Kayashta, which was considered a Shudra by many. And he was giving initiation to Brahmins. The heart of a Vaishnava is something very deep. Today is the disappearance day of Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj. He appeared in this world sometime in the mid or late 1700s. And he, and that was in Bangladesh. After he became a Babaji, he would spend half the year in Vrindavan. He lived actually many years in Vrindavan. And then later on, he would sometimes be half the year Vrindavan, half the year Navadweep. He lived at Surya Kund. Many beautiful stories. But we don't have so much time. I would just like to share a couple stories that are very much illustrating the principles of these verses we're reading today. He lived to over a hundred, I think 147 years old. He would be half the year Brindavan, half the year Navadweep. Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he on a trip to Vrindavan first met Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj and in his heart of heart accepted him as his prominent guru in life. He even declared him to be the commander in chief of all the Vaishnav community. When Jagannath Das Babaji was later living in Bengal, a place I think Amalgar, Bhaktivinoda Thakur went to visit him there and deepened, deepened the quality of their association. Bhaktivinoda Thakur invited him to come to Navadweep. He was living in Kulia area. His, he was very old. He had a servant named Bihari. And Bihari was very strong. He would carry Jagannath Das Babaji in a basket on his shoulder. 
And when they were, when they were going from Amalagara to Navadweep, Bihar, Bihari Lal um, arranged for a simple but nice guest house for him to stay in. When they arrived, Jagannath Bas Babaji Maharaj said, I will not stay in a guest house. Let us live under a tree near the bank of the Ganges. So he's living under a tree. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur built him a nice bhajan kutir right there near that tree. It was built by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And then some other wealthy people, they, they built some other little huts close by for his disciples, other Babajis, to live. Jagannath Das Babaji would love to go with Bhaktivinoda Thakur from village to village to promote the chanting of the holy names. That's practically all he did day and night is chant the holy names, Japa, Kirtan. That was his life, his soul, and serving Vaishnavas. One time in his hut, he was doing Madhukari. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. He doesn't know, okay. So one street sweeper, obviously Shudra cast at the best, a street sweeper gave some roti to Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj. And he very, very gratefully accepted it and ate it. So other Vaishnavas were, began to criticize him. What kind of Vaishnav? He's taking cooked food from the hands of a street sweeper, lower caste? So they went and they challenged Jagannath Das Babaji. Why you have, to, why you have done this? You have taken grains cooked by a street sweeper? Jagannath Das Babaji responded very boldly. He said, there is no higher purification than the dust of Navadweep Dam. Every grain of dust of Navadweep is more valuable and all the wealth in Brahma's creation. We read in all the scriptures, we read in the writings of the great saints of how purifying it is to roll in the dust of Navadweep, to put the dust of Navadweep on your head, to eat the dust of Navadweep. Well, these street sweepers, they are so fortunate. Day and night, they're covered with the dust of Navadweep. Who will be more fortunate and pure than them? Therefore, they are true Vaishnavas. They are real Vaishnavas because the dust of Navabhita is covering their bodies 24 hours a day and they are performing such menial service to Sri Navadvip Dham. Therefore, I have taken their rotis for my purification. 